I don't know if you are familiar with the name Hans Zimmer. You probably aren't. But he has received two Emmys, I mean two Oscars, four Grammys. He's been nominated for two Emmys and one Tony Award. Rumor has it he knows what he's doing. And what he's doing is, if you've ever listened to a movie, a film, the music that is in it comes from Hans Zimmer. There's a number of movies. Uh, I came across a list of his top ten, meaning just that's the top of the ones he's done, including The Lion King, Gladiator. It goes right down the line of all these themes that you've heard. Hans Zimmer not only creates songs and composes them and produces them, but also, if you've ever listened in a movie, there's this music sometimes that just kind of goes through it. You might not really pay attention, but it often helps describe the feeling that is there. He also sometimes, it's not really a, a collection of musical notes, but it's two or three or four musical notes. I was watching a video and, and watching how he constructs sometimes with two or three or four musical notes. For example, a question. The theme, the scene is getting kind of, you, you know, everybody in the room knows that there's a question that needs to be asked. And then you hear this little, these few notes. And you realize the question is getting ready to happen. Sometimes it's very gentle. Kind of like, what do you think? What do you think is going to happen next? Sometimes he can use those same notes or different notes in a more dramatic, more intense way. And all of a sudden it changes. What do you think is going to happen? What? When? He has that ability with just a few notes to ask a question without even using words. He is a master at doing that. I think Joshua was also a master at being able to ask a question without any words. You remember the situation, Joshua? Nancy read the scripture, the story about what is going on. He's called all of the people together, the leaders. When we were in Idaho, the regional minister there, and, and regional ministers are like conference ministers in the Disciples of Christ and the United Church of Christ, and they're, they're responsible for being supportive to 60, 70, 80, 100 churches of helping develop programming and being there when you have problems or, or help guiding. They don't rule the churches, but they're there for help, to assist. Larry Christ, the regional minister in Idaho, had a phrase that he would often say. He said, it's time for a come to Jesus meeting. He wasn't being flippant. He wasn't being irreverent, but it was when a church or some clergy or some members, they were struggling and, and they had some issues before them and they really needed to pay attention. They really needed to find answers. They really needed to address what was going on, not just assume it would go away. He called it a come to Jesus meeting. We understood what he meant. Joshua is having a come to Joshua meeting. Because he's watching what is going on and he's very concerned. He's very concerned about what the people are doing and thinking, their attitudes, how it's changed. You see, if, if you track what is going on and how they got there, Moses, of course, led the people, the slaves, if you will, into the wilderness. And it was there in a very harsh environment, very harsh, demanding, that they were just trying to survive. We've talked about that before, how, how sometimes, though, that enabled the people to start understanding how to rely on God, to really pay attention to that and support one another because there were no safety systems there. There was no security. It was survival, and they did that. They, they did 
They learned what it meant to be faithful in the harshest of ways. But then, but then, as they were released and they went into the promised land. Now, I don't want to promote what happened for them to get there. If you read the history of what happened, it's, it's very harsh. It's, it's the manifest destiny, their version, of they were given the land of the Amorites, the land of the Canaanites. Well, given's really not a good word. But, but if we can get past what happened for that to happen, just they have arrived. They are there in the land of milk and honey. They are in the promised land. And they're starting to look around, and, and Joshua sees what is happening. That slowly, but, but surely, they're starting to look around and say, Ooh, this is nice. We've got water. We've got water. And you have to understand in the desert, water means survival. We have water. We have land. Land that you can grow things to eat. We can raise animals. It's a whole different world. And the, the, the civilization that the Amorites and the Canaanites had created, it, that word infrastructure, they had it. And so now these Israelites are in this other location and they're starting to look around Joshua sees and senses and feels. They're starting to look around and say, ooh, this is pretty good. Maybe we don't need God that much. Maybe, maybe just look what we have. We can get by on our own now. Maybe we don't need to pay attention to God, to Yahweh. To the Lord God Almighty, maybe. Hmm. Joshua is feeling that. He's seeing that. And so, so he's brought the people together for this come to Joshua time and say, look around, folks. Do you see what I'm seeing? Do you understand that, that you're starting to... Well, who are you going to serve? That's what he asks them. Who, who, who are you going to serve? The God of the... The Egypt, the gods of, on the other side of the river, the god of the Amorites, the god of the Canaanites. Who, who are you going to serve? Because you need to choose. You need to decide. The people say, yay, of course we're going to serve God. Of course we are. And then it's there. He says, he says, if you think you can serve the Lord God Almighty, you are wrong. <coughs> Did you hear the question then? Did you hear the music in the background just kind of set it up? The question of, do you really think? Do you really think you're willing to serve God, do you really think you're going to be able to do that? Do you really think you want to? He, Joshua is way past the celebration. Yes, of course we want to. He's seeing right through it. Do you really think this is what you're willing to do? And he talks to them about what it means. You see, I think we need to back up a little bit and talk about what does it mean to serve God? Because that's, that's this other question that, that, if you listen, you can hear it in the background. What does it mean to serve God? Sometimes we get confused, I think, that what it means to serve God. <laughs> when I was in third grade, I started making a record of everything I had done, good or bad, wins or losses, successes or failures. And at this point, after all these many years, I'm up to about 42.34%. <laughs> no, I didn't. Of course I did. I started in eighth grade. No, no. No, of course you can't do that. You cannot record like that. But by the same token, if you could... 
What would that percent be? I know one thing, what it wouldn't be is 100%. And we know that. We can't be perfect. We won't be perfect. But sometimes that's what we think when we hear that, that Joshua is talking about serving God and we immediately go back to Deuteronomy that you, if you're going to serve God, you shall love the Lord your God. You know this. You shall love the God, love God with all your heart, with all your might, with all your soul, with, all, with everything you have. Remember that? And Jesus takes it even a little bit further, rightfully, and says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your might, with all, and love your neighbor and love yourself. See, it's a package deal. If you're going to love God, that's what you're going to do. You're going to love your neighbor. You're going to love yourself. That's what you're going to do. And so is that what it means to serve God with all that you have? And love your neighbor with all that you have? And love yourself with all that you have? That bar is pretty high, isn't it? And sometimes, sometimes we think to do that we have to be perfect. We have to be great. About 20 years ago, an author, Jim Collins, wrote a book, Good to Great. The subtitle was How Some Companies Become Great and Others Don't. And his premise was that good is the enemy of great. And his thought was that sometimes we settle for just being good. And we, we give up that opportunity to be great. I would challenge that. I would flip that around and say that great is the enemy of good. Because sometimes we equal great as being perfect, of getting it exactly right. And you know what happens when we do that? We realize we can't do that. And sometimes that disappoints us. Sometimes that, that just... In fact, we, we realize that loving God, loving our neighbor, loving ourselves isn't about being perfect at all. In fact, it's not about being great. But it's being exactly what Joshua said about serving God sincerely and faithfully. Okay. It would be great. It would be perfect. If by, let's say, 3 o'clock this afternoon, we dismantle racism. It's gone. It's gone. The only time you ever think about racism is when you're looking back at the history and you realize what it was and what a monster it was. But 3 o'clock this afternoon, it's done. That'd be great. That'd be perfect. It's not going to happen. But what is going to happen? in being sincere and faithful in serving God is that what is going to happen is that we are going to keep working at it. We are going to put ourselves on the line. We are going to do what it takes to talk about it, to act upon it, to move it forward. That's what we're going to do. You see, have you ever watched somebody chop down a tree? I've never seen anybody say it's a big tree, maybe a sequoia, maybe it's a big oak tree, big sturdy trunk. I've never seen somebody knock down that tree with one swing of an axe. Have you? But I have seen people that they kept that axe swinging time and time and time and time and guess what? Eventually that tree did topple because they kept at it. Have you ever seen somebody climb a mountain? A real mountain, one of those massive mountains, they don't go straight up. It's not a straight line. They go and then sometimes they have to go to the side to get better footing, to get a better handhold. Sometimes they even have to drop down just a little bit because they have to keep safe. They have to find that best path. 
but eventually they get up to the mountaintop. We are not going to dismantle racism by sometime this afternoon. But what we are, we're going to keep working on it. We're not going to give up. We're going to keep at it because, you see, that's who we are. And that's what we're made of. It would be great, wonderful, perfect, if... Remember this Supreme Court ruling that just happened last week? You remember what it decimated so many lives. It's just torn us up and we are so frustrated and angry. So let's say by Tuesday of this week, by 5 o'clock in the afternoon, we will do away with that judgment. Roe versus Wade will be instituted, but this time actually it's going to be done better. This time, women's rights are not only going to be protected, but they're going to be expanded to be equal. That which is, should have happened a long time ago. By, by, by Tuesday? Was that it? By, by sometime on Tuesday? That's not going to happen. But what is going to happen? is that we are going to keep working at it. We are going to talk about it. We are going to make messages. We are going to work at it so that we can restore the dignity to women. We will find a way. But it's going to take a time. It's going to take a while. It's going to take a lot of energy. It's going to take this commitment. But, but then, that's who we are and what we're made of. I worry a lot about climate change, do you? I honestly am concerned about our granddaughter and, and children, generations to come. What is going to happen when we have the most polite term I can say is knuckleheads uh, making decisions about our climate? Wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be perfect by, let's say, the end of next week? we have found the way to cure the problems, that we have found the actions that we must take, the policies that must be impacted, and acted upon and, and make it be so that by next week, climate change will have been corrected, that we can get back to the way it can be. That's not going to happen, is it? But we are going to keep working on it. We are going to keep talking about it. We are going to find ways that we can move that a little bit closer, whatever it takes. We're not going to ignore the issues of climate change. We have to do something, and we will, because again, that's who we are and what we're made of. You can talk about the problems of the concept of homophobia. If you want to talk about that, all the ills and the injustices and how harsh that is of people just wanting to live their lives, just being able to choose who they love. And all the problems, all the damage. Well, how about midweek next week? That homophobia is no longer. It's done. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be perfect? It's not going to happen. You and I know that. But what we are going to do is keep working on it. Keep talking about it. Keep raising the awareness of it. We're going to keep at it. Because that's who we are and what we're made of. And we could add other things in there, couldn't we? Gun violence, hunger. Take your pick. There's all sorts of issues and we are going to keep working on it. We're going to keep working on it because that's absolutely who we are and what we're made of. And I think that's what Joshua was trying to get across to the people as they gathered. Who will you choose to serve? The question was heard by the people. Even without words being used, it was there. They knew it. 
If Hans Zimmer was here with us today right about now, you'd start hearing a few notes being played. Maybe I should have choreographed it with Bill Bloom. <laughs> It's our turn to choose. The question is there. We don't even have to ask it. Who will we serve? It's time to choose. Every day, let us choose. I want to segue, so to speak, into our time for communion. Because I think the same phrase that I was using, that's who we are and what we're made of, relates directly to our time of communion together. Because when we gather around that table, against the odds, if you will, that all of us with our different understandings, our different personalities, our different lifestyles, everything that we would think we would fit around that table, that we would be welcomed at that table. That's very counterculture, you know. It's against the odds, you know. And yet, that's what we're doing. Gathering around this table that we've been invited to to realize that once again we are to receive this gift. Let us prepare our hearts and our minds. We're going to sing our hymn in remembrance of me, number 403. times I invite you to keep these in your pocket in your lap don't open them yet because it's so difficult everybody's trying to figure it out just wait we'll get there we will because I want us to talk first about what's right in front of us remember when Jesus gathered his followers around that table all different 
in many ways different. But he, he wanted them to understand something. So the first thing he did was to take the loaf. And after giving thanks, or he blessed it, and then he broke it, and then he shared it with each one, saying to them, Take, eat, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. Take, eat, this is who we are. Take, eat, come to this table. Remember who I am, remember who you are, so that we might feed the hungry, we might clothe the naked, we might give drink to the thirsty, we might reach out beyond ourselves and love our neighbor and love ourselves, for that's what we do when we serve God. Take, eat, this is my body. Jesus then took the chalice, the cup, and he said to them, drink of it, all of you, for this is, well, this is me. This is my spirit. This is my blood. This is my flesh and bones poured out for you. Just as you will pour out all you have for others. Just as you will be with those who are afraid, those who are lonely, those who are isolated, those who are oppressed, that you will pour yourselves out for them as well. Drink of this, all of you. So today we come once again to this table because, yes, this is who we are and that's what we're made of, to accept that invitation so we might be with others. So let us now attempt to open these little packages again. Take your time. Take your time.